arrived six months ago, just after Christmas, and uh, I was persuaded to do this job over the, over the Christmas period when I probably wasn't thinking quite straight. But uh, nonetheless, um, here I am. Um, and uh, when, when we set off six months ago in January, um, there was, as you know, a lot of ministerial interest in this as a result of the uh, media coverage of poor fundraising practice and of the outcomes of the Etherington Review. And the minister seemed to think that we could probably get the new organisation up and running from scratch in about a couple of weeks. I think mm -hmm. was probably what he had in mind. Of course, those of you who've done anything like that will know that it's not that straightforward. And uh, I actually think we've done pretty well um, to have got the organisation up and running in six months, which was, in fact, always, always our target. Um, and uh, just to say that we will be launching on the 7th of July, uh, when we will become the fundraising regulator and the FRSB will hand over its responsibilities to us. Um, and at that point, we will take over the code of fundraising practice from the Institute of Fundraising, and I was talking to them about that this morning, uh, putting the final touches to, touches to the uh, document of assignment and we'll take over the rule books on door-to-door -door collection and street collection from the PFRA. Um, and when we launch on the 7th of July, we will um, particularly need to have in place on our website the complaints procedure, so people now, now will know that they, they need to come to us rather than the FRSP, and we can explain the process of how we will handle complaints and, and adjudicate. So they're key things to get ready uh, for the launch. I think in the in the six months there has been a bit of a sea change in attitudes in the sector. Um, when I first arrived there, was, there seemed to be quite a bit of denial around. Um, you know, it wasn't us, it was them. And um, what about our beneficiaries? Those sorts of uh, questions, as if you can separate out your beneficiaries from your donors. Um, but I think, I think that has changed. And um, I think one, one indication that that has changed, apart from the evidence of conversations I'm, I'm having all the time with uh, charities in the sector, one piece of evidence is that when we asked 50, the 50 charities with the highest fundraising income um, to support our setup costs, so you know we arrived and we had to go around with a begging bowl at the beginning, which was not, in my view, uh, the best way to do things, but um, hey, we didn't have any choice. Uh, so we asked the 50 charities with the largest fundraising <coughs> income all to, to contribute to our setup costs over the first six months. And it's been an interesting process of negotiation and dialogue, but we've now got 43 charities on board, and there are four others who we're still in, in, in discussion with. So we've managed to uh, uh, raise enough money from those charities to cover the setup and, and to keep ourselves going for the first six months. Uh, I'll come on to funding um, thereafter uh, later on. Um, and I think that is an indication that, that, that uh, charities, and these were obviously the larger charities, um, very much appreciated uh, that uh, things had gone wrong and that there needed to be uh, some new regulation. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's all right. Um, I think the other thing that's happened over the period, of course, is that you'll remember the Olive Cook case, which was, I guess, one of the main uh, things that went wrong that led to the Etherington Review and, and the new regulator. That was largely about data selling and data sharing, um, probably illegally, in fact, I think almost certainly illegally. Um, and I think that has really changed across the sector, that those larger charities in particular who were engaged in data selling and data sharing are no longer doing it and the Institute of Fundraising has already some time ago changed the code of fundraising practice uh, to prohibit that or at least to prohibit data selling um, and, and only allow data sharing if there is the right sort of specific consent for that. Um, so, so things have moved on and of course <coughs> The other aspect of the way in which things have moved on is the new European regulation um, around direct marketing. And I think if you were to look at um, 
very carefully, and there's, uh, there's been a bit of survey work done on this, which has been quite indicative, although not conclusive. Um, if you were able to look at this in great detail, I think you would have found that most charities, even the large ones, were not operating their consent procedures in line with the data protection legislation and the PECA legislation, which covers um, contact, direct marketing contact um, um, by email. And I think that is one of the big issues um, that we need to take on. Um, charities need uh, the proper consents. I think in, in the European regulation it's now uh, phrased as um, unambiguous, um, evidenced, uh, informed, and freely given consent. It doesn't necessarily mean opt-in for the lawyers here, and I welcome any views on that. Uh, but if you are going to contact people for direct marketing purposes, for fundraising purposes, you definitely need to have those consents, or as a charity, you are breaking the law. Um, and I think there's been a realisation that that's the case over the last six months. And of course, as you'll probably know, a number of the larger charities, in discussion with the Information Commissioner, who pleases uh, data protection uh, matters and direct marketing matters, um, a number of the major charities, such as um, uh, British Red Cross and uh, Cancer Research, have gone over to uh, an opt-in system for all of their consents. So, I think the, the scenery uh, or the scenario is is definitely shifting, and um, I think those who were saying that all of this criticism was unfair and disproportionate, which of course some of it was, and not all charities, in fact most charities, were not guilty of any misdemeanours at all. Um, I think they are recognising that 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 um, <coughs> charities need collectively uh, to sign up to that there needs to be more effective fundraising regulation and, most important, better fundraising practices uh, in place. And I think the evidence has really been that um, even if most charities were not the guilty parties in all of this, that it has had um, a very negative impact um, on the sector. A key recommendation of the Edmonton Review then was the creation of a new and more powerful fundraising regulator to replace the Fundraising Standards Board, and that's us. And the review concluded, importantly, that the Fundraising Standards Board was under-resourced and hampered by a lack of independence, because essentially it didn't own and control the code of guidance or the rule books. They were controlled by the Institute of Fundraising and the PFRA. And so a very key recommendation of Everington was that the regulator should own um, the fundraising practice code. Um, and I have to say that um, over the last six months, I've received really um, firm and, and uh, consistent support from the Institute of Fundraising, the Public Fundraising Association, uh, the NCCBO, not surprisingly, since uh, the Everington Review was still at Everington's report, uh, and, and indeed from the Charity Commission, our fellow regulator. And that's included, in fact, secondments of staff as well as information and advice. The Edmonton Review, as you'll know, um, proposed three lines of defence against unacceptable fundraising practices. Firstly, trustees. Secondly, the new regulator. And thirdly, the Charity Commission. In, in that order. And um, particular emphasis has been put by many people on um, the role of trustees in getting a grip on what's happening <coughs> around fundraising in their, their organisations. And indeed, we've had most recently the, the CC20 guidance from the Charity Commission, which is all about that, which was published uh, last week. And I think trustees certainly do need to stand up and be counted on fundraising issues, but I think in a way um, they've been a little bit unfairly targeted because trustees can't do that sort of job effectively if they're not getting the right sort of service and information and advice from their senior management teams. So um, a corporate and responsible approach to fundraising is as much a matter for the senior management team as a whole as it is for the trustees as a whole. Um, but 
he think that both parties need to make an unequivocal, an unequivocal commitment to best practice in fundraising. The, uh, the second of the three lines of defence is the new regulator, and we will be, will be independent. I prefer independent, actually, to the idea of self-regulation. Um, we're not statutory, but we are independent, and we will own the code of guidance, as I've said, and we'll be funded by a levy on the larger fundraising charities, rather than the membership scheme uh, which the FRSB operates which I think, again, to an extent, compromise their independence. I'll come back to the levy again later as well. So we'll, we'll have to work closely, and we'll want to work closely with the Charity Commission, and we'll have a memorandum of understanding with the Commission, which should be signed off at the launch. We'll have to work with the Information Commissioner, and obviously the Institute of Fundraising and the Public Fundraising Association. And we... We want to adopt an approach which is one of support and encouragement. Um, we want to work with charities to proactively promote good practice and help them to do the right thing. But of course, we will need to adjudicate on complaints. We'll need to uh, follow up cases which are more than just an individual complaint, but are cases that are of public interest. And we'll need to adjudicate and make recommendations <laughs> amending the code of guidance so that the code of fundraising practice is necessary. And I have to say that where a charity declines to accept our conclusions, and this was set out in the Edmonton Review, we will take steps to enforce compliance, albeit voluntary compliance. Um, and our sanctions will include, include naming and shaming, orders to cease and desist, and the requirement to approve future fundraising uh, campaigns. The uh, the Charity Commission then will be the third line of defence and that will provide the backstop uh, for the fundraising regulator. And if all else fails, uh, we'll refer to the Commission contentious uh, cases that may breach their own guidance, CC20 or indeed other guidance, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and particularly issues which will concern uh, the conduct of trustees and governance issues around funding. Um, and I'm really pleased that the Commission has now got around to publishing um, CC20. Um, you'll also be aware um, that Ministers have taken reserve powers in the Charities Bill um, to move to statutory regulation, including a statutory requirement to pay the levy, if the new stronger voluntary approach to deliver um, the necessary changes um, doesn't work. Um, and the indications are, I have to say, that in those circumstances, ministers will be prepared to use those uh, reserve powers. Um, but we all hope, I think the sector hopes, and we hope, and ministers hope, uh, and the Charity Commission hopes as well, uh, that that will, not be, that will not be necessary. That this collaborative, voluntary approach will, will bear fruit. Um, I, I do... I do recognise that more robust regulation is only part of the answer to the, uh, the current problems. And I also recognise that no regulator, whether a regulator statutory or voluntary as we are, um, can be fully effective without the confidence of the public and support from, in our case, the charitable sector that we regulate. Um, we must be seen by the sector to be independent, fair, transparent and proportionate and we must be ready to listen to the genuine concerns of the sector. But I need to say that uh, if we're to play our part in rebuilding public confidence in the sector, um, then our first accountability has to be to the public, to the donors, to the consumers, um, not least those like Olive Cook and Samuel Rose, um, in, in both cases have appeared in the media, who are particularly vulnerable to oppressive fundraising <coughs> tactics. Let me just pick on, on two key issues. Um, first, the fundraising preference service, which seems to have uh, caused a good deal, a deal of anxiety and, and alarm in the sector. Uh, this was a key, uh, a key recommendation of the Edmonton Review. And uh, we've had a working group, uh, which was there before I arrived, actually, looking at the shape and scope of the fundraising preference service, um, chaired by someone who's now a member of our board, George Kidd, 
and uh, looked after by the NCBO. And thanks to the NCBO for supporting that, that working group. Um, the, the working group, as many of you may have seen, uh, a couple of months ago produced some initial proposals for consultation, and there were 140 responses to that consultation. And uh, as a result of that, the working group is now finalising its proposals for fundraising preference service, which, we, which they will then put uh, to our board. Um, and I think if you, if you did see the, uh, uh, the document that went out, um, what we're looking at now is not the, uh, the red button, I think, that the ministers first envisaged in the Edmonton Review envisaged, whereby someone would press the red button and they'd be um, immediately released from any contact with any charity in any form. We're looking at something a, a, a bit more nuanced. I think there was a general recognition that that was uh, likely to have unintentional consequences in terms of uh, charities' relationships with its supporters and donors. And uh, so the, the, the more sophisticated proposal, I mean, I won't go into details of what we're actually going to come up with, but if you saw the consultation document, you'll, you'll have grasped that um, we're looking at uh, whether uh, this should apply to all channels of communication, whether it should apply um, to all charities, uh, and um, whether it should apply just to fundraising communications rather than other communications. The problem there, of course, is, as you all know, that fundraising communications are very often part of a much wider communication about what the work the charity is doing. But the one thing we don't want to do is to um, is for people to press the red button, uh, not quite realising what they're doing, and then to fall out of contact with a charity that actually they really want to support. And we don't want to intervene in, in the relationships be between a charity and its volunteers. Those sorts of communications that you might have with your volunteers are not about fundraising. They're about support and, uh, and uh, collaboration. So, so, so we don't want to intervene in those. So when the final proposals uh, from, the, uh, from the fundraising uh, preference service working group come to the board, I'm sure there'll be a recognition there of all of those issues. Um, nonetheless, just to underline that the, the key issue which was behind the idea of a fundraising preference service was uh, so that a vulnerable person, such as Olive Cook, although as we all know, uh, or we're told by our family, Olive Cook didn't in fact commit suicide because of, uh, because of the, uh, the way in which she was being harassed by charities. But nonetheless, uh, a vulnerable person like our family, Olive Cook, who was, being, um, who was being contacted by over 40 charities, would be able to press the button and say, I don't want this anymore. So, that's where we are on the fundraising preference service. Just coming back to opt-in that I talked about before, there is an opt-in working group as well, which is convened by the NCBO, which will report shortly to the NCBO, and then the report will come onto my board, um, about um, how charities respond to the uh, the new general European regulation on data protection and uh, how they deal with the need for uh, proper consent, as I indicated before. And I would say that, um, if anything, I think that getting the consent right is more important than the fundraising preference service. In a way, the fundraising preference service is a backstop. Uh, if things have not been handled in the right way in terms of fundraising and consents. If everybody were getting the consent regime right, then there would be no need for the fundraising preference service. However, um, the, the new, re new European regulation is not implemented until, um, I think, around May 2018. Um, and I think that although charities should start to do the right thing now in terms of the... Uh, in terms of the, uh, the regulation, uh, and as soon as they can, they should move to a proper consent regime. Um, it is clearly going to take some people quite a while uh, to make the necessary changes. And perhaps just a final word on this issue about the role of the Information Commissioner as opposed to our role. Uh, my, my, my firm view is that it's clearly a matter for the Information Commissioner 
uh, to interpret the legal requirements across all sectors, not just for charities, and to um, ensure compliance with the law in terms of data protection and in terms of consents. Um, I think it's our job to then go beyond that and to translate that into, into guidance on, on good practice in terms of consents. And this goes back to what I said about opt-in. If the sort of consent that you have to give um, under the new regulation can be satisfied by a number of routes um, and not necessarily just by opt-in, uh, then the Information Commissioner should stick to giving that good legal advice. We should then, uh, as I say, translate that into good practice and, and if we wanted to say, yes, best practice is opt-in, then we could say that. But it's a matter for us, I think, rather than for the Information Commissioner. Um, lastly, then, a, a quick word about um, timetable. Um, the next thing that's going to happen in the next couple of weeks uh, before the launch is that we will uh, announce our proposals for the levy system and the registration system. And the idea is, in the Edmonton Review, that the levy would apply to all charities who spend more than 100,000 uh, per annum on, on fundraising. And they would be liable to pay the levy. I think that's probably the route it will take, though I'm not certain yet. Um, and we will then graduate the levy uh, according to size of, 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 of expenditure on fundraising over 100,000. Um, so not everybody will be paying the same levy. And that should net us um, something like um, just over 2,000 charities uh, who would be paying the levy. And uh, uh, our running cost budget, and this again was, was set out in the Edmonton Review, but I think you got it just about right, our running cost budget will be between 2 and 2.5 million. And that goes back to the point I made about us having more resources in the fundraising standards board. Um, they ran on a budget of about half a million and they had something like five or six staff, some of those part-time. Uh, we're looking for a budget of between two and 2.5 million and something like 15, uh, 15 to 20 staff. And we believe that, that is what's needed uh, to be a proactive um, regulator in the sector. Alongside the levy will sit the wider registration system and uh, that will be rather like the FRSB membership scheme, although it will be a registration scheme, and it will be linked to a statement about how we'll conduct our business and on the charities part, um, a commitment to observe best practice and cooperate with the fundraising regulator. So there will be something similar to the FRB's tick um, to show that a charity is, is, uh, is uh, registered and, and committed. So we will publish those proposals on the levy and registration in the next couple of weeks, uh, and I very much hope that um, that uh, people will respond to that and let us know their views. Um, the second thing, as I said, that will happen uh, is the launch on, on the 7th of July. And then on the 13th of July, at our board meeting, the board will consider the recommendations from the Fundraising Preference Service Working Group. We will then, um, after that board meeting, come out again with, with the final proposals for the fundraising preference service, again, to see people's, people's views. Um, just a quick word about geographical coverage. Um, the, the, uh, uh, the intention in the Edmonton Review was that, like the FRSB, we would cover Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, and England. We will certainly cover England and Wales. We will almost certainly cover Northern Ireland. Um, but Scotland has a, a separate uh, charity regulator. And um, there is a Scottish working group which is looking at um, which is looking at fundraising regulation in Scotland. And it is likely that they will come up with a hybrid proposal. Um, you can decide for yourselves whether that makes much sense or not, but a hybrid proposal that uh, will, will involve us regulating charities that are based in England but operate in Scotland, and uh, a separate system in Scotland regulating the charities um, that are based in Scotland. 
Um, and uh, we, that, that will mean that we regulate something like 80% of the funding in Scotland. Uh, and so if that is what they come up with and that is what is agreed, there's nothing we can do about that. It's a decision to be made in Scotland. We would, we would cooperate fully um, with whatever Scottish system they put in place, and it would probably be um, a panel reporting to Oscar, the, the Scottish regulator. Um, we can work very closely with Oscar, I'm sure. The key thing is that we need to keep one, one code of fundraising practice uh, across the UK for the sake of consistency, both for charities uh, and for uh, consumers, for donors. Um, lastly, then, um, just just a quick word about our government. Uh, our governance. We've got a board of ten people, um, and we've got a standards committee and an adjudications committee, and they're just about all now um, uh, up to speed, and and uh, all of the appointments are made. Um, and we've really tried hard to strike a balance between regulatory experience, fundraising expertise, and wider knowledge of the charitable sector. These are interim appointments because we didn't do them by open advertisement because there wasn't time. Um, but after two years, we will, we will advertise all of those posts um, on the open market, so to speak, which I think is the proper way to do it. We are instantly a company limited by guarantee, not a, not a charity. Um, and uh, one, one last thing on governance. This is not really part of our governance, but we are very keen to do this. We want to work very closely with Commission of the Donor Experience. So in our work, we're drawing on the views of donors and the public as well, particularly in the work that the Standards, uh, uh, the standards Committee does. The, um, so the last six months have been particularly interesting in terms of engaging with the sector, uh, with a variety of charities of different sizes, and, and getting people's views on what needs to be done. And I really do hope that that engagement will continue once we've, once, once we've launched. Um, because as I said before, we really do need to build the confidence of the sector in what we do. And I think it's really important for all of us that together we get this right, both for the future health of the charitable sector and the well-being, most important, the well-being and confidence of those who wish to donate, donate to charities and support the great work uh, that you all do. Um, we have a website, um, as some of you have probably seen, it's very much in its early stages, uh, but as I say, it will shortly have the details there of the complaints processes, and you can already contact us via the website. It's uh, predictably at fundraisingregulator.org.uk. Thank you very much.